I'm hearing more and more people saying that intersample peaks, ISPs, or more specifically the clipping they can cause, is actually inaudible. That they are a theoretical concern that we really shouldn't be worrying about when we're mastering, and we don't need to use intersample peak aware limiters or worry about what the intersample peaks are. Now, that's always seemed unlikely to me. I think I've heard clipping caused by intersample peaks on multiple occasions, and it's always seemed like an important theoretical issue to me, particularly because it's part of the broadcast standard, the R128 standard, and also now the recommendations for supplying files to online streaming services, for example. But I've never actually done the tests until now. Um, now I have done the tests, and honestly, the results surprised me. So I thought you might be interested to see and hear what I found. Before we get onto that, though, maybe a quick introduction on what intersample peaks ISPs are and why we might care about them. So here's an example song, which you can see has been mastered very loud. This is Monarchy of Roses by Red Hot Chili Peppers from the I'm With You album. And there's nothing in particular that's special about this song. It's just a real world example that I happen to know has a lot of intersample peaks in it. So as you can see, it measures minus 4.6 LUFS integrated loudness, um, and the sample peaks are up at 0 dB. And we can see that very clearly if we zoom in on the waveform. This is quite a nice example. These dots are the sample values, and the line drawn between them is the reconstructed analog waveform after the file is decoded. And you can see that the levels there are banging right up against zero. But the really interesting thing is when we look at peaks like this one here, or in particular this one here, if I zoom in on that further, you can see that even though one of the sample peaks is right up at zero, this one is not. But the reconstructed waveform actually goes above zero. And if we pull down the loudness a little bit to give ourselves an extra dB of peak headroom, you can see that this is an intersample peak. This is a point where the reconstructed analog waveform goes above 0 dB full scale, the sample peak level, and there is the potential for extra clipping to occur as a result. And that's actually how I like to think about intersample peaks. They aren't actual sample peaks that exist in the recorded data. They are more like predictions of peaks that could happen. So the concern is that when a piece of audio like this is played back on a digital to analog converter that doesn't have enough headroom to reconstruct fully that peak that goes above 0 dB full scale, that you might get extra clipping introduced. But even more of a concern is what happens if additional processing is added to that file. And in particular, especially these days, what happens when the file is data encoded with lossy compression for the streaming services? Because in this case, there are intersample peaks of as much as 1.5 to 2 dB above zero. And if we go back into Rx, I can show you what that looks like. I've reduced the overall gain of the file here by 3 dB so that we have some peak headroom. Here is how the waveform looked before AAC encoding, and this is what it looks like afterwards. You can see that the peak levels throughout the file have quite dramatically increased. And I should say that these are not intersample peaks now. Because of the processing, because of the AAC encoding and subsequent decoding, these are actually sample peaks. They aren't predictions of a potential problem anymore. They are actually encoded sample values in the file. The audio actually has these extra peaks. And if we look at the statistics, we can see that the loudness has been reduced by 3 dB, but the peaks are still getting up above minus 1. So if we've reduced the overall level by 3 dB, but the peaks are up at minus 1, that means that these new peaks are 2 dB above the zero level of the original file, which is what you can see when we look at this here. And that's because the encoding process for AAC and any lossy audio codec is actually very aggressive. The audio is split into as many as 60 different frequency bands. 
The encoder uses perceptual coding to decide which of those bands are the most important. It throws away the least important. It keeps the most important. And then it rebuilds the whole thing when it's decoding it. It's a very aggressive process. It's not surprising that the peak levels change. So that means that the prediction, if you like, of the ISPs from the original file of a potential peak increase of 2 dB was correct. So the next question is, does it really matter? Because AAC and other lossy codecs use effectively a crude version of floating point. So these peaks are cleanly stored, and by reducing the gain, we can get them back. And nobody ever listens to audio, or hardly anybody listens to audio at maxed out volume anyway. So is anybody really going to hear any potential problems caused by this clipping? The answer to that is yes, because several of the most popular decoders for streaming services and lossy audio reduce the file to fixed point immediately after decoding. So that means that all this extra peak information that we can hear gets sliced off, it gets clipped before the file gets to the volume control or the normalization, with the potential for extra distortion. And that, of course, brings us to the most important question of all. Can we hear it? And to test that, I've lined up two copies of the same file here. These are both the decoded AAC file. But as you can see, they both have a reduction in gain of 3 dB so that those peaks aren't normally going to be clipped. But on this version at the bottom, I have added the standard clip clipping plugin. I have it set to hard clip. I have it set with no oversampling, and I have here a ceiling set of 3 dB. So that means that because we've reduced the file level by 3 dB as well, any peaks that would have been above zero will be clipped, but only on this lower copy of the file. And this one up here, it's just straight file. And I'll just quickly demonstrate that there is something to hear there with a quick null test. If I enable this here to flip the polarity and play these files back simultaneously, So the null test shows that there is potentially an audible difference between them. The question is, will we be able to hear that difference listening to the music? So let's take a listen and see what we hear. I'm not sure how much of that is going to come through on the stream and on YouTube, but to me, there is a subtle but clearly audible difference. And this is why I say I was slightly surprised when I first heard it. I expected the clipped version to sound more brittle, more distorted, if you like, because extra clipping distortion was being added. In fact, what I heard is the opposite. I feel that this version where we've reduced the level but we haven't clipped the signal actually sounds more lively which actually makes sense because we have extra transient information in the unclipped version, which has been removed in the clipped version. Now, I've done enough listening tests like this to know that I have fooled myself in the past. So the next thing that I did was to fire up the Hofer 4U AB comparison plugin. And as you can see, I correctly identified the unclipped version four out of five times. But I have sometimes got results like that before, just by chance. So then I fired up the ABX app and did a full blind ABX test, just because I knew that me saying ISP clipping can be audible is likely to get some pushback. 
and I wanted to be absolutely sure that I was giving you accurate information. On my first trial, I scored 7 out of 10, which might seem like a good result, but isn't conclusive. It's not what's called statistically significant. It could still be a fluke. So then I tested myself again and again. I scored 7 out of 10. The good news for me and my sanity is that adding in the HOFA results, 18 out of 25 is a statistically significant result, meaning that it is 95% likely in doing these tests that I'm hearing a genuine difference between the files and not just fooling myself. Now, of course, this is just me with one musical example. This is very far from a peer-reviewed scientific trial, but hopefully it's a useful example. I feel like the difference is not that difficult to hear. Maybe you can even hear it over the stream. And I'm sure if you do similar tests, you'll be able to hear similar results. So hopefully that demonstrates that intersample clipping really is audible, at least on some material, and with a fairly high loudness. Now, that was obviously a fairly extreme example, but it's not uncommon at all. I see regularly major label and indie releases with intersample peaks at plus one, plus two dB, which is going to cause similar issues, especially when it comes back from streaming. And of course, that's a super important situation because that's where the vast majority of people are hearing music for the first time these days. I thought it was really interesting that it was still possible to hear that difference, even though the original source was already heavily clipped, heavily limited, and had quite a distorted quality to the sound. And I thought it was really interesting the, the way that that distortion sounded. It didn't actually sound more brittle or edgy or aggressive in the way that I expected. It actually sounded flatter and less interesting and less exciting. And I think that's really important to notice because often when the loudness has been pushed very hard like that, the goal was to get excitement and energy and an, an edgy feel into the sound. So in this case, the intersample clipping is actually working against that goal. I thought it was also interesting to notice that if you had reduced the input level of that file, if you just taken that original master, reduced the level by 3 dB before encoding, then you could have avoided that downside to the intersample peaking issue. The file would then have been 3 dB quieter, obviously on the streaming service, but it would still have been about 6 dB louder than all of the major streaming services distribution loudness levels. So they would have reduced the level further for 80 to 90% of people who were listening. So again, that change could have been made without changing the artistic integrity of the original at all, without significant detriment to the sound, in my opinion. And I think the final point to make is that this is one situation that I've given an example of, but Intersample peaks can get baked into the sound in other situations as well. For example, if you took a file that has intersample peaks in it and import it into Logic at a different sample rate, into a different sample rate session, then sample rate conversion will take place. It will be immediately stored as a fixed point, probably 24-bit file, and any intersample clipping artifacts that were caused by that process would then be permanently baked into the sound in that situation. And the same applies to a range of other signal processing that we might want to do. So there you go. I hope that was useful or interesting. Let me know in the comments what your experience is with intersample peaks. Have you heard examples of ISP clipping or have the results in this video surprised you? Has it changed your mind or will you still not be paying attention to them because you don't think they're that important? And if you enjoyed this video, I think you'll also love a free PDF I've put together called the Home Mastering Guide. It's a simple PDF and it lays out what I think are the six essential steps everyone needs to take to release their music with complete confidence. Uh, it's completely free and you can get your copy at homemasteringguide.com. My name is Ian Shepherd. Thanks for listening.